Good evening to you. And uh, we're going to take the first few minutes here and recognize our, our Bible school students who have been working very hard uh, in our lower classes especially. And so uh, they're all going to get a special award tonight. Uh, the long ribbons up here represents the memory work that they've been doing. Uh, some have been able to do all seven verses, and so the purple represents that. Others memorized uh, some of the other verses, and then everybody has been real faithful in attendance, and so we want to recognize our, our little ones. Uh, little ones, you can make your way down to the front row if you'd like to, and uh, for the time being, or you can just come when your name is called uh, by Jamie or Matt. Uh, you just come, and they'll give you... Uh, your prize, okay? So uh, we're going to take this a uh, couple minutes to do this. Yeah, come on down. And uh, we will, when you hear your name, you come over and see Matt and Jamie. Gracie. I'm not sure which Gracie. Raylene. Where'd it go, David? Zane. Liam. Mason. Nola Rose. <laughs> Purple ribbon. <laughs> Jamie, hold him up for a picture. Grinley. Okay. I'll call this in. Yeah, I get to call them out, but you get your picture. <laughs> Kennedy. And the purple with the metal on the end is that they've done every one of them. Is that correct, David? Yes. Every one of the uh, verses they've memorized. Gabby. Bryce. Kaylee, Melanie, was it Cameron? Cameron, Ellie, John, Kesley, every picture 
made with Uncle Grandpa there. No, your Uncle Grandpa, go ahead. All right, that's all of them. Good evening. It's good to see this number out tonight. It's been a beautiful Lord's Day. A little chilly, but it's been a beautiful day. We've got a few announcements to go over again. Some of them were gone over this morning. Uh, on the sick list, Eulene Logan will be having surgery on the 22nd. That's this Wednesday. Isabella Seegers is in Huntsville Hospital. We need to keep her and her family in our prayers. Jasper Pitts, recovering from surgery. Megan Pitts is at home, not feeling well. And also tonight, Kelly James is at home, not feeling well. Wyatt Spann, four-year-old boy who has been on our prayer list, passed away Thursday. Please keep his family in your prayers. Under events, the Monday night meal delivery Please be here by 4 p.m. if you wish to help prepare the plates and deliver. That's tomorrow evening. Please be inviting uh, to our upcoming Ladies' Day. That's this coming Saturday, January the 25th. Upsurge is tonight after church. Uh, you're supposed to see Chris or Jamie uh, after church immediately if you're going to be involved in that. The men's class that we have periodically through the year will resume tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. in the fellowship hall. There'll be a new college class that's going to start on February the 2nd. Uh, if you need a book for that, if you're going to be in that class, please see David for a book. There are a sign-up sheet in the back of the foyer that's been placed there this evening. Uh, pertaining to the evangelism seminar that we just had this weekend. If any of you that were not able to be here, or some possibly that were, if you want CDs of those lessons, uh, the guys are going to be making those. But on the sheet in the back, it's got it divided up into the different particular lessons uh, and then the separate ones for the men's and women's. And if you'll mark which ones you want copies of, they'll get those made and get those to you. Song leader tonight will be Brother James Rogers. And uh, Moral Fuller will have our opening prayer, and Houston Hutto will have our closing prayer. Let us bow. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we bow in thy presence, as thou hast gently drawn the shades of night about us again, we thank thee for the opportunity of gathering together tonight to come to thee in prayer to sing songs of praise of thy name and hear thy word proclaimed to us. We thank thee for the positive side of our education program. We see young people that's learning things that's important to their lives. For we know the scriptures say, if we train up a child in the way he will go, when he's old he will not depart from it. Help us to encourage our young people Help us to impart words of wisdom unto them. Set good examples before them. We're mindful of those who are older young people who are high school, college age, 
We know they face many temptations. Help us to also encourage them. And we as adults are not immune from temptation or things that can easily beset us in our daily walks of life. Help us to always strive daily to live as close to thee as we possibly can. We pray for the eldership of this congregation as they provide for the spiritual feeding of the flock here. As we work together, as we try to influence those we're in contact with, that they can see Christ living daily within our lives. We pray for those who have been brought to our attention as being sick, those who will be having surgery. We pray that Thou will be with, be with them. Help us to do what we can to encourage them and help them in whatever way we can. We pray for our nation as we face many conflicts, many problems, many things that affect the daily lives of all of us. People placing great emphasis on things of a world in nature. But we pray the leaders of our nation may look to thee for guidance and strength. We pray that as we come about with election, election times, we may elect men that are honest and have godly attributes in their lives. We pray for <clears throat> each of us as we live our lives daily that we can conduct ourselves acceptable to thee and when our life on this earth is ended that through their grace we'll be, thy grace we'll be able to live with thee through eternity is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Number 552, Walking Alone at Eve, for our first song this evening. Walking Alone at Eve.
number 518, Beyond the Sunset. Our invitation song this evening will be number 605, Bring Christ Your Broken Life. And before the lesson, we will sing number 520, An Empty Mansion. Let us stand as we sing.
Allison was starting to yawn before I even got up here. That tells you something. So. Our overriding theme tonight is back to the Bible. Back to the Bible. It's so appropriate that we're able to mention the work of our, our Bible school program uh, this evening. We need to be talking about it more, and uh, we are going to talk about it more. Uh, what is represented on this table, even though all the little ones couldn't be here uh, tonight, it is a, uh, it's a representation of a lot of hard work. And that comes from our teachers, our teacher helpers, those who spend time in, in the classroom uh, fixing up the different visual aids. Um, our teachers will um, be working on their lessons. They never, you never stop working on your lessons. It's always on your mind, and you keep trying to think of the very best way to get uh, that particular biblical, that particular Bible account, uh, that particular Bible person. Uh, how can I get this across? I've got the little ones this week. I've got the, the older ones this week. How do we get that across? And this represents just quite a bit of, of work and, and effort, uh, both from our teachers and our uh, students and we just, um, we just want to say thank you. And this time, as we are switching now to the New Testament times, uh, we just thought this would be a good time to recognize what they're doing. We pray for our, our efforts in Bible school that it will, it will uh, inspire our parents and uh, grandparents to study and read the Bible, uh, not only here but at home, especially at home, especially when you're not here. And that's where the real training uh, occurs. So back to uh, the Bible. We'll be looking in Acts again uh, this evening, Acts chapter 9, the passage we were at this morning with Ananias, Acts chapter 9 and verses uh, 10 through 19. Also adding to that this evening, Acts 22 verses 12 through uh, 16. Acts 22, verses 12 to 16. We're still on the occasion when Ananias comes to Saul of Tarsus. It's a huge event. And tells him what God would have him uh, to know. Back to the Bible. We allow this incident in Scripture to help us keep going back uh, to the Bible. It's really the theme that we were focusing on back in the summer, last summer, when we did our VBS, we called it Back to the Future. It's really a back to the Bible ideal because the only way to really uh, think about life now and toward the future is to go back to that time, back to the Bible, uh, and allow the Lord to, to direct our lives. In John 16 uh, 13, Jesus promised the apostles. When I send the Holy Spirit upon you, He will guide you into all the truth, A-L-L, -L, all the truth. And that's exactly what happened. And the apostles over time preached the good news in its fullness. And over time, God guided them and a few others to sit down and write the New Testament scriptures. And we can be fully assured that what we are reading in the New Testament New Testament is exactly what God would have us to read. And that is, that is our standard. That's our guide. So we go back to the Bible. Looking at these passages this evening from Acts 9 and Acts 22, I want to focus on a few areas where we need to go back to the Bible. In the first place, let us go back to the Bible as far as the gospel message is concerned. I know that sounds very fundamental, but you'll understand why in just a minute. Let's go back to the Bible as far as the gospel message is concerned. We mentioned this morning that God did something very special with Ananias. He came and he spoke to him. He said, Ananias, I want you to go to a particular place. I want you to go to the street called Straight. I want you to go to a particular house that belongs to Judas. I want you to look to it for a particular man named Saul. And this man is blind. He... The Lord appeared to him. The glory of the Lord appeared to him. He can't see a thing. There will be men surrounding him. I want you to go right there. Okay. What does that have to do with the gospel message? Just this. 
God in those miraculous times, in those early days of the church, He did a lot of direct speaking, but I want you to notice this. He never spoke directly to a person in order to give him instructions about salvation. God, and even in the miraculous times, even in those early days, God never spoke directly to a person in order to give him gospel instructions. He always had the preacher show up or the teacher or the messenger show up, a human messenger show up with the gospel message as to what a person must do in order to um, receive salvation. When... When the Lord appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he said, well, I want you to go on into the city, into this particular house, and it will be told you there what you must do. And in the Lord's workings, he had Ananias come, a human being Ananias, with the gospel message to come and instruct uh, Saul what he must do to receive the blessing of Jesus, the blessing of the cross. Always remember this, that God did a lot of miraculous things in these days, but when it come down to a person receiving salvation and what he needed to know, he always seen, sent a human messenger to make that known. We need to go back to the Bible as far as the gospel message uh, is concerned. The same thing happened with the eunuch. When Philip led the eunuch to a knowledge of salvation beginning in Isaiah 53, well, the eunuch didn't know over in Acts 8, 26, we read that an angel of the Lord came and told Philip to go in that direction. The eunuch had been uh, to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home and the angel tells uh, Philip to go and intersect this and then he goes in that direction and then you read in Acts 8 and 29, that the Spirit then, God the Spirit, comes near to Philip and says, you see that chariot? Go join that chariot. And he ran to join that chariot. But when it came time to, to instruct the unit upon what he must know and what he must do to receive salvation, God backed off. Okay. I think that is something that is occurring there. That's something that uh, we read and it jumps off the page to us for us to understand the importance of teaching the gospel. So let us go back to the Bible in, by way of the gospel message. In the second place, we need to go back to the Bible and stay there. We need to go back to the Bible as far as uh, a sure foundation is concerned. A sure foundation. We mentioned this morning that Ananias almost had a natural fear. Any of us would, would think about it as we are told to go and, and speak to Saul of Tarsus of all people. We read there in Acts 9, uh, 13 and 14. But um, Ananias expressed his fear to God there. But in Acts 9, 15, he says, go your way. Uh, so this is a double sending here. In Acts 9, uh, verse uh, 11 and 12, he had told Ananias, you go to this house where he's at. I want you to go there. So that's his first sending. But then after Ananias sort of has a little battle with God, then um, God said again, you go, you go. Okay. And then uh, he goes. And, but here's what the Lord said to Ananias in Acts 9, 15. He says he's a chosen vessel. He's a chosen vessel. Vessel means that Paul would carry the name of Christ everywhere. That's what we're to do. Vessel means that you're carrying the message. We mentioned this morning in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7 how the gospel has been placed in earthen vessels. That's us, earthen vessels. Those of us who have been made out of dust. Okay. Uh, God placed, He placed this treasure in earthen vessels. It's a treasure. It's a treasure. There, there's no greater value than salvation of the soul. Jesus says in Matthew 16, verse 26, What shall it profit, if he, profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? There's just nothing more valuable than this gospel message. And it's contained in the earthen vessel. 
So vessel means, on the one hand, it means carrying something. It's, it's, a, it's a device that carries something, and we are that, that device that carries the gospel. But for Paul here, for Paul, it also meant that Paul would not be coming up with his own message. Paul's not the source of the message. Paul is simply going to be carrying the message. Okay. Remember this statement. Our faith is based not on speculation, but revelation. Our faith is based not on speculation, and take your Bibles, with, but it's based on revelation. See, Paul is, Paul has been part of God revealing directly the gospel message to him. Let's read what Paul says about this. Galatians chapter 1. Turn with me in your Bibles. Galatians chapter 1 and see it for yourself. What Paul says. Galatians 1 beginning in verse 11. He says, I would have you to know, brethren. Galatians 1 verse 11. I would have you to know, brethren, that the gospel that was preached by me is not from man. It's not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For the apostles in these early days, the gospel was revealed to them directly from the Lord. Okay. They, they did not learn it. It did not come from a man. Look on down with your eyes in Galatians 1, 15. Paul says, beginning in Galatians 1, 15, But when he who had set me apart before even I was born, he who called me by his grace, when, it, when he was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone else. In other words, God revealed the gospel message to Paul, okay, and he didn't go and check out, check what he had received with other men. He simply received it from the Lord himself. I didn't go and consult with anyone else, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. Okay. Paul's just expressing this idea that he, along with the other apostles, received the message of the cross in a direct way. It was revealed to them revealed to them. And so our faith is not based on some man uh, figuring out some sort of system that will help people feel better. No, our faith is based on something that has been revealed from heaven to these special men, these honest men, these, these men who gave their lives uh, for the truth. Okay. Now, go back with me to Acts chapter uh, 22 for just a moment. Turn over to Acts 22. As we're thinking about this idea of going back to the Bible for a sure foundation. Going back to the Bible for, for, for a sure foundation. Notice what Ananias is going to say to Saul. Acts 22 in verse, uh, beginning in verse 13. He's going to say, Brother Saul, Receive your sight. And at that very hour, Paul said, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. Notice this. To see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. Okay. That's a promise to Paul specifically. And then is saying, the Lord has appointed you to to see Jesus, the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have both seen and heard. You might remember that the apostles, Peter and John, said this very thing to the Jewish officials who had uh, brought them in. Acts 4, verse 20 they had charged them not to teach anymore in Jesus' name. And they said, we cannot but speak the things which we have both seen and heard. Paul here is, 
is being given the opportunity, the special opportunity reserved just for the apostles in these days in order to bring the gospel message in ultimately to print, to, to, uh, to form the New Testament. God, God is allowing Paul to both see the righteous one and to hear his voice in order that he might be a witness to what he has seen and heard. Think about that word witness for a minute. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said to his apostles just before he ascended up on high, he says, you shall be my witnesses, my witnesses beginning here in Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. We are not witnesses for Christ today. Okay. Especially not in this sense that the Bible uses it. Okay. Only, the, only the apostles and others who were seeing Christ, the things that he did and hearing from him, can said to be witnesses. Okay. Well, we are gospel teachers, but we are not first-hand witnesses uh, like they were. Notice uh, the same idea over in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost and Peter's words. Okay, So if you look in Acts chapter 2, as Peter is making the connection between Jesus and his identity and the things that have been said about the Messiah coming from the Old Testament, he's connecting that. He's saying Jesus fits the picture perfectly. If you notice in Acts 2 and verse uh, 31, Concerning David, it says, He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of this we are all witnesses. We are witnesses. That's what Peter said. And so the very fact that these gentlemen who were honest and sacrificial and had a wholehearted, devoted sense of faith toward Christ. These men were eyewitnesses to what they saw. God revealed this to them and they were to proclaim to the world what they had seen and heard and all of that became the gospel message. Therefore, our faith doesn't rest on speculation but rather on revelation. It was revealed directly to these men from heaven and we're thankful for that because that makes that makes our faith that much sure uh, in the Lord. Take your Bibles and look with me to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 in this regard. 2 Peter chapter 1. I don't really hear any Bible pages moving. What are you doing? 2 Peter chapter 1 and beginning in verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 19. Peter says, We have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you would do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's Revelation. That's revelation. It, God directly revealed it to them. They were witnesses of these things. And so that makes our foundation even more sure. It makes it very sure in Christ. So let's go back to the Bible in gospel message. Let's go back to the Bible in having a sure foundation. In the third place, let's go back to the Bible for authority. Authority. If you look there in Ananias' words to, to uh, Paul, and then before that, uh, if you look at God's words to Ananias there in Acts chapter 9, he tells Ananias, Paul is a chosen vessel, and he's going to bear my name. He's going to carry my name to a lot of people, to, to the Gentiles. He's going to stand before kings like Felix and Agrippa that we read about. 
And he is going to carry my name even before the children of Israel. Paul's going to go into these synagogues and, and talk to his own fleshly brethren. But notice it says he's going to carry my name. My name. When you read about the name of Christ, most of the time, you're reading about the authority of Christ. For example, if you look over to Colossians chapter 3, 16 and 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, notice this, Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord. Do all in His name. Brother Rob mentioned this particular passage in Acts chapter 8 yesterday. If you want to look at it again, Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. Philip is in Samaria. What did he talk about? He talked about the good news of our Lord. And many were baptized. But notice particularly uh, what he spoke about. In Acts 8 and verse 12, it says, But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Notice that. They preached about the name of Jesus. They preached about the kingdom of God. And they also preached and they were baptized into Christ. <clears throat> I'm going to do a little advertisement here. As we think about going back to the Bible, going back to the authority of Jesus, it was the suggestion of Brother Whitaker over the weekend that we use these lessons, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, to help bring someone to Christ. And these are simple little booklets that can help us do that. Why do I mention that now? Well, lesson one is on the authority of Jesus Christ. And it ends by making the point from Scripture, of course, that there is a difference between the old law of Moses and the new law of Christ and how that we're under the new law of Christ today. So the authority of Jesus is talked about here. Lesson two talks about the church, the church and the importance of the church, the church and the, um, and the importance of, of salvation in the church, the church in regard to its organization, the church in regard to its mission, and how that we're added to the church once we are, have been uh, washed, uh, our sins have been washed away. So this book two is on the church. And then book three talks about sin and the tragedy of sin and how to uh, deal with sin through the blood of Jesus and gospel obedience and the plan of salvation. So these are simple little booklets. They just have the scripture reference. You read the scripture uh, reference uh, together and then you answer, uh, you, you fill in the blank that is beside the scripture. Very simple. Well, Rob's suggestion was that we as a congregation go through these he made this suggestion, uh, I think he made it publicly, but then he also talked with our elders about it, and our elders agreed. And so starting next Sunday night, we will go through book one. And it will take us at least a couple of weeks, if not more, to go through each book. It's going to be a different sort of lesson. It'll just be, we'll just be reading the scripture and then filling in the blank. Reading the scripture, filling in the blank. As a means to get, number one, to get acquainted with these basic, basic references and basic ideas, but also to learn to how to sit down with someone that you can use this method to lead someone to Christ. Okay. You don't have to be you don't have to be able to get up and, and quote a bunch of scriptures. The scriptures right here in in these booklets for us. We read them together, and then we fill in the blank. And uh, it's it's very simple, but very very effective. And so we will work on these on Sunday nights, beginning next Sunday night. We'll have a PowerPoint that goes along with this. But it, it won't be our normal preaching service. We'll be, uh, each, each of our members will have these booklets. It'll be next Sunday night. Good Lord willing, you'll have this booklet in your lap. 
and you will fill in the blank as we read the scripture together and as, um, as we mention the answer it needs to be in the blank. Okay, but we're very little uh, comment, very little comment. Aaron doesn't think I can do that. Okay. Okay. See, Aaron talks so much, you just have to say something about it. But, you know, he doesn't think that I can get up here and not make a lot of comments. Well, I'm just going to show him. Okay. Because that's not the way to do it. You know, when I have, I have used these over the last um, six months especially with, with different ones. And you don't make a lot of comment. You let, you let the scripture do the talking. Okay. Very little comment. And you might say something about, you know, who's doing the speaking as we're about to read this verse and who's receiving the message. But other than that, we just let the Bible uh, talk to us. So we'll begin that, uh, good Lord willing, next Sunday evening. Uh, so we want, to learn, we want to learn these basic ideals once again. That is very helpful. Every time I sit down and, and talk to someone about uh, the gospel, I feel like I walk away learning a lot more than anybody else. Okay? We want to learn these basic truths again and again. Then we want to see this as a means of taking these booklets and sharing them uh, with others. And then also, you might want to consider this. If you've already been speaking to someone about um, becoming a Christian, encouraging them, uh, it might be good for, for them to be here. If they can make the commitment to be here with you, sitting right in this audience, wouldn't that be wonderful? Because it's not going to be about preaching or the preacher. It's just simply going to be uh, reading the scripture and filling out the blank and letting God uh, do the talking. And so consider that as we're going back to the Bible, thinking about the Bible, uh, being and going back to Bible authority. And so when we're thinking about going back to the Bible tonight, I just want us to think about going back to the gospel message. Okay? Even though there was miraculous times, even though God you know, spoke to Ananias directly, still when it came down to sharing the good news of salvation, he always uses humans. And he has not come up with another plan. And there's not ever going to be another plan. And then let's go back to uh, the Bible uh, for assurance and a good foundation. Okay. And we've talked about how that it's not speculation, it's revelation. Let's go back to the Bible for Bible authority. And then finally tonight, as we read through Ananias speaking to Saul, we've got to go back and talk about Bible baptism. Because that's what it comes down to here in Acts 22 Verse 16, this, this particular account helps us in various ways talk about uh, baptism. For one thing, it did not do Paul or Saul at that time any good to do all that praying as far as salvation is concerned. He prayed and he prayed for three days. Okay. He, was, he, was, he was full of remorse he was full of regret, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. If anybody was ever going to be saved by the sinner's prayer, it would have been Saul of Tarsus, but he was not. Okay. The Lord tells Ananias, says, go to this house of Judas, and Saul is there, and behold, he is praying. Find that over in Acts 9, verse 11, I think. He's praying. He's been praying. That's what it means. He's been praying. He continues to pray. But he did not receive forgiveness of sins as we read here in Acts 22, 16 until he got himself up and was baptized and then his sins were washed away. If you'll notice here in Acts 22, 14 and 15, Ananias further will say to, to Saul directly, he says, it has been appointed to you from the Lord to know his will. Think about that. Here, here Saul has been, he's been praying for these three days. He, he, he has gone without food for three days. Okay. He earnestly wants the Lord to know his remorse. He, he feels terrible about what has happened. And look, Ananias says, well, it has been appointed for you, Saul, to know the Lord's will, to know his will. Well, obviously, up until this point, 
Saul is still lacking in knowledge. If Ananias is coming now after three days of this praying, and he says, it's been appointed to you, Saul, to know his will. That means, as of yet, Paul, Saul, lacks some knowledge. He's lacking in some serious knowledge. And not only he, in Acts 22, Paul is actually rehearsing his conversion story before his Jewish brethren there as he is arrested in Jerusalem. So not only up to this point had he lacked in, in spiritual knowledge, but he's letting them know that they're lacking in spiritual knowledge if they keep serving under the old law. And so we learn here about baptism. It's baptism first, and then we're added to the family of God, and then we can pray. Notice what did Paul do in verse 17 of Acts 22? Notice what he's doing in verse 17 of Acts 22. He goes to the temple and he prays. And there the Lord hears him. And there the Lord responds to his prayer. It's baptism first and then prayer, not the, not the reverse. Salvation doesn't come as a result of a sinner's prayer. If one is that still outside of Christ, never been baptized into Christ for remission of sins, and then the sinner's prayer, that just... That doesn't avail. That doesn't work. Okay. This is plain scripture looking at us. And we need to desperately, the world needs to hear this and we need to share it uh, with them. Another thing about baptism is to see once again its priority. We mentioned this this morning from Acts uh, 9, 18 and 19. He, he went ahead and was baptized even before he received food and he had been without food. He had to be hungry, but there's something more important than food. Didn't Jesus once say, Matthew 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You remember what Job said, Job 23, and verse 12? I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That, that's what kept Job faithful. He says, I esteem the words from God's mouth more than I do my daily food, my necessary food food. And so notice even here the priority for baptism is seen in Acts 22 verse 16. Notice what Ananias says, why do you wait? Why do you wait? We have a song based on this phrase. Why do you tarry? Now why do you tarry? And so there's a priority toward uh, baptism. There have been many times just in my limited experience. And I'm sure many other preachers and, and uh, teachers could tell of other experiences, but there have been many times in, in my experience where when a person decides to be, to be baptized, they'll say, I've been meaning to do this for a long time. And they mean sometimes, they mean 20 years. Sometimes when they say, I've been meaning to do this for a long time, they mean 25, 30, and 35 years. Thankfully, there are still able to fulfill that command of God. Bap baptism has a priority that goes with it. And then also we learn here about baptism that it's to be a personal decision. The literal reading here is Ananias saying, Saul, arise and get yourself baptized. Or, maybe to be a little more plainer, Saul why do you, Terry, arise and start making arrangements to get yourself baptized? It is a personal decision. Okay. Only the person who is a candidate to be baptized can make the decision for him to be baptized. No one else can do it for them. This, of course, wipes out the idea of infant baptism, right? This also wipes out the idea of baptizing children. We don't baptize children. They're not ready to make this decision. This also wipes out the idea that no one should be baptized in order to simply make unity in their marriage. That has happened a number of times where a wife or a husband, whichever, will decide, okay, I'll go ahead and be baptized. I don't really believe in this, but I want certainly to keep unity in my marriage, unity in my home. 
He wipes out the idea of, of being baptized because Grandpa says to do it. Only the person who's a candidate for the baptism, a proper candidate for the baptism, we say that, you know, to be a proper candidate, right, you've got to be a penitent believer. You've got to be willing to repent of your sins, turn from them. You've got to have a faith that's based on the Word of God and Jesus as the Son of God. And you've got to be willing to profess your faith publicly, and then you are a candidate for baptism. And you've got to be old enough to understand what it means to be lost. Only that candidate can make the decision uh, to be baptized. Okay. And then notice this about baptism. It is associated with cleaning, cleaning up our soul. It's associated with cleansing. Notice it says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Sin causes our soul to be polluted, dirty, unclean. And God's plan has in it, as a part of that cleansing, obviously, is baptism. Baptism. To compare this, turn over in your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. In verse number five, Paul saying there, we are saved not by works of righteousness which we have done ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us with the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Notice a similar passage in Ephesians chapter 5. We mentioned it this morning. Jesus has sanctified his church. He has cleansed it by the washing of water and the word. These washings of water, this washing of gener regeneration, this washing of water with the word can refer to nothing else but baptism. What else would it refer to? You can't, because of your numerous texts, numerous passages, Regarding baptism's association with salvation, it has to receive, it has to mention, it has to include uh, baptism. Remember, Jesus to Nicodemus said, Except you be born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So the soul is polluted, and <coughs> baptism has a great association with the cleansing of the soul. And then notice this about. Baptism. There, there's nothing magical about the waters. There's nothing magical about the waters. But what baptism does from God's mind, okay, not man's teaching, but from God's mind, baptism allows a person to access the blessings of the cross. Okay. For an example of this, if you notice in Hebrews chapter 9, 13, and 14, that it is the blood of Jesus that will cleanse our conscience. But notice also from the mouth of the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 3, 21, the light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. The blood of Jesus brings a pure good conscience, but baptism is also part of bringing that good conscience and so, therefore, you have to conclude that baptism is that access to um, the blood of Christ. In Matthew chapter 26, as Jesus talked about the Lord's Supper, He said, This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And Peter himself, again, is led by God to say in Acts 2 and 38, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Back to the Bible. There's no better journey. There's no more important message than this which is emphasized. And we hope and pray. And if you will, will you please pray that as we do these booklets next Sunday night, that much good will come from it, that we will build our confidence in sharing the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, that we will be renewed in our zeal for the Lord, and that many others will come to know Jesus 
as their Savior. Will you be praying about that? We're going to go back to the Bible by way of gospel message, go back to the Bible for a sure foundation. We want to go back to the Bible for Bible authority, authority of Jesus. We want to go back to the Bible baptism. And we want to make our stand there. Appreciate you being part of this service this evening. And it may be that as we have gone through these various scriptures, it might just very well be that you have already decided in your heart to renew your zeal for the Lord. It may be that you have, you have found that, that in your past life that you don't feel like you have, you have contributed to the cause for the Lord as you ought. You might feel even that this has brought some shame on the church. If you'd like to come forward and pray about that, and that's the promise to Christians. You know, after baptism, we just, we pray. We pray, and we pray together. As James 5, 16 says, we confess our faults one to another and pray for each other. And so if we can help you either with gospel obedience or with coming back home to God, help, let us do that this evening, and let's stand together and sing at this moment. Christ to Supper this evening. If you, if you have that need, please uh, make your way back to the conference room during this uh, final song and the communion will be served at that time. We do look forward to being together uh, tomorrow evening. Perhaps you can help with the meal delivery. Also, uh, if you can come out for men's class about 6.30, that would be great as well. We do have, let me look and see. Sister Beth, the meat's still on, right? Meat thing, good, yes. Okay. So, Beth had told me earlier that, that we have a bunch of barbecue meat in the, is it already warmed up? It is, okay. So. Uh, in the fellowship hall. It's in the fellowship hall. For anybody who wants to come. For anybody who wants to come. Okay. So that's tonight, right after our uh, dismissal. So. <laughs> We had a lot of barbecue meat and some desserts left over from yesterday, so feel free after our dismissal. If you're hungry, make your way back uh, to the fellowship hall, and that, that can be, um, you can take advantage of that. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for your help, Kim. We will sing number 401, The Lord Bless You and Keep You, for our final song. I believe I led this one last, um, last time I had singing Sunday night. I'm sure you'll forgive me, but I like it so much I might make it a practice. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat>
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you. Thank you for all the many opportunities of life that you've given us. Especially thankful for the opportunities we've had to come together today to study thy word, learn more about how you would have us to live our lives and to better equip ourselves to be the soul winners that you have us to be. We ask you bless our efforts as we try to improve our skills as we interact with the people in our lives that we'll better be prepared to bring them to an understanding of their position in life, that they're where they're at, that they need the Lord in their lives. If they don't have the relationship they need to be, we'll be better equipped to uh, make them aware of this and carry them to the next step. We ask you to be with those that are less fortunate than us, those that are struggling with sickness at this time, that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that are ministering to them, that you'll give them the wisdom and and the knowledge of things that need to be done to help these folks to be back to a better portion of health. As you be with us as we're about to part and we go to our homes, that you guide, guard, and direct us, thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cruel cross, that we have the hope of uh, spending eternity with thee in heaven someday. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.